Hey guys, um, I'm just gonna check that my sound levels are okay. The microphone is pretty far, so this is going to cause some weird noises, but I'm gonna get it a bit closer while trying to keep the recording on at the same time, hopefully. Nope. Oh. Totally messed it up already. Just a second. Please, Lord, work. <laughs> now it works. Uh, but the microphone is in the way. Oh, come on. <laughs> Maybe I'll just speak extra loud for the entire thing. Okay. Um, I'm gonna just switch these first. Sorry, this is such a huge hassle, but I need to make sure that the recording is on because I'm making a YouTube video here at the exact same time. Oh. Which is not as easy as one might imagine. You would think that I've been doing this for so long that it would be kind of like a press of a button, but no. No such luck. So this um, color palette that I'm using, I have taken a screenshot of it. And the reason for that is because I want to edit these colors with curves or hue adjustments before I use them. And this is like a really quick, cheap way to make new palettes out of the ones that you already have because once you have your um, colors in harmonious once you have achieved some kind of color harmony with your palette you can just go into hue and saturation and then just do this and you will have variations of that same palette in different ways so these are going to be in the same value range, but instead of making a new palette out of them right away, I'm just going to keep them here. Actually, I want to select all of the extra bits out so that they don't distract the composition that I'm making. Okay. So this way I can use uh, two palettes at once. I'm gonna set a background color because I really hate it when I'm painting and then the white gets mixed in with the rest of the colors. I'm not sure if this is the right color to use for a background, but I could maybe try something else like this. The differences look so subtle on a palette, but when I see them on a full canvas, it's a huge difference. Okay, now I just probably need to get this whole thing out of the way, so that it doesn't distract me too much. And then make a new layer. I'm going to paint underneath this. I included the streaming method in the frequently asked questions. Once you open a uh, Zoom and press screen share, it's pretty much uh, self-explanatory. You don't need a separate tutorial for it. Just open Zoom and press screen share. That's really all there is to it. To get something going, I need to kind of focus on blocking in some colors first. To get a feel for 
what this painting would be. Someone's first live stream. Yeah, I was supposed to start like early in the morning, but life just got in the way. This is still my morning coffee that I was planning to drink <laughs> while starting this live stream. So stuff. It's a really nice uh, rainy fall weather outside. get that out of the way because the colors aren't really my priority yet. All of that can be edited later, but right now I'm just trying to find a shape that would work for this. I have like a vague idea of what, what the painting could be, but like all of the details are a mystery to me. So this is going to probably be a lot of painting and repainting to get things working. And my idea for using this painting is that I could uh, use it as a painting video or that uh, Q&A video that I have already shot. So all it's missing is a painting. So that's why I'm doing this. The good thing about live streaming is that when I'm live streaming, I have to have the image on three separate windows. So I see it in different scales. So even though it's difficult to plan and design a painting when I'm in a live stream, because obviously this has like those time pressures that can be intimidating. But at the same time, just the fact that I have started this session like it allows me access to these windows and it, it makes the composition a bit easier to control so that I don't zoom in too much and do something stupid like start doing details at this point.
The reason why I wanted to use this uh, Mikko Ralph brush is because the texture is really easy to control with this. And I wanted there to be this kind of like... Hmm, kind of grainy texture that looks like a foggy day. Because I think it goes well with the color palette that I am using. Also, any brush that has this sort of like um, grainy texture, they're great for layering brush strokes in different colors. And when you see through those different layers, then the surfaces get kind of more interesting to look at. And especially if you are painting for print, I think those kind of details are just more satisfying to watch. I'm gonna move the camera a little bit because it's right in front of all of the comments. Or maybe I should move the window itself. Because this camera is placed on like boxes of boxes. So if I move it, there's a chance that I will just topple over the whole thing. Okay, now I should be able to see you a bit better. Hello Mikko, all the way from Australia. I've never been in Australia and I would love to visit someday. Like, it's a huge place, so it would probably be very expensive because it doesn't make sense to stay just a few days. I would love to travel and see all the landscapes available there. Like not all of them, but just a lot of the stuff that I would love to see in Australia. In case I need to go, love your content. Uh, thank you. Hey, anyone using iPad Air? I haven't used it myself. Um, apparently the new iPad mini has kind of the same hardware specifications. I think the iPad mini is just so cute. I would love to use it. I, I, I don't have any need to use it, but it's just, it looks very cute, I think.
big chunk of middle of Australia is pretty much red dirt. Noelani is saying, yeah. Okay, well, I can probably skip most of that part then. Still, the coastline is huge. I guess Finland is most really just green because most of Finland is just forest. And of course, tons and tons of lakes. Is this really green? That is shocking. This is green color. Like the one that I'm picking from right here. Unbelievable. It doesn't look like that at all in the source. from Morocco. Hi. Uh, Vamonite is asking specifics about the painting. No spoilers. There's going to be plenty of fog though. Very, very foggy. Stuff. And uh, Probably like low contrast transitions.
just quickly switching the eraser to the same brush as my main brush so that I don't get two different competing textures. You can kind of easily not even notice the effect that it has when you're painting, but when you have a large scale print on your wall and you notice it, it can be very annoying. By the way, uh, you can consider this whole painting as me doing my own exercise that I said in the end of that um, light and shadow tutorial that I just uploaded earlier this week to the mob. So. I'm not just trying to make you do <laughs> Uh, homework for nothing. I do think it's useful and it's how I paint, so this painting can be like proof of that. So funny, I'm working on a commission right now, drawing a mountain, Matterhorn, uh, and watching you painting a mountain. Uh, I don't know what kind of a mountain Matterhorn is, but I'm going to Google it later, and this stream is over. I'm trying to be like quite fast with this, because uh, I know at some point my boss will want to go out. I'm trying to teach her to run a little bit. We're doing very small sprints, and if she manages to get through the sprint without um, stopping me, then she gets a treat. It worked uh, quite well a few times yesterday already, and I'm hoping that if I keep at it, we will be able to go on short runs together. I think it would also be very good for her to kind of get rid of all of that extra energy that she has. Because uh, she is a work dog. So she can definitely run longer distances if she gets used to it. But it's just challenging because she needs to fight against her genes because she wants to hurt me when we are running together. So that's what the training is for. Whenever she manages to get through a stretch of uh, land without hurting me to stop, then she gets rewarded for that behavior. Wow, I went way too far with that huge change. Okay, let's try that again. Again. 
completely overshot it. No, this is just impossible. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, focus. Okay, and there it is. <laughs> That's the color. <laughs> Sometimes when you're hunting for a color, it can be just like so, so close, but so far away. Especially in those, you, you could see how small that difference was in the palette. Like I just moved the sliders so slightly that I possibly can with my own hand movements. I would need to have like a full screen palette to do that. But when you see that color here against this green, in this context, that's a big difference, right? So it's worth going that over that whole thing over and over before you find it. I'm still not sure about the aspect ratio because I think uh, the composition could be a bit more interesting if I change the whole canvas size. So I'm glad that I'm recording this because otherwise uh, I can't trust the Procreate recording. When I change drastically the canvas uh, aspect ratio, it kind of messes up the whole screen recording and I end up losing a lot of the resolution. from the beginning of the painting session. Is this from Mikko's brush set? This is from my Brushes for Painters set. Mikko Raul. Manning Johnstone is saying hello. Love that tut. I'm assuming that you mean that uh, light and shadow tutorial. I'm, I'm glad. I was kind of worried that it's kind of going over the same thing too many times, but I wanted people who see that tutorial to like absolutely understand how the light and shadow logic works and how you can mix those colors. Because I want the next tutorials to kind of like go onwards from this point so that people can see the tutorials in order and then kind of like the next tutorial can be like more advanced. That's why the tutorial series is called From Beginner to Advanced, because I don't think you need to have like any painting skills to start those.
I think there could be some kind of like interesting valley type of brush strokes here. Something that works as like a bookmark for the entire painting. So that people don't kind of slip out from the bottom half. This is obviously like super low resolution, so I'm going to increase it a little bit. This, uh, here is the middle line. Um, I am pointing it with my pen, but I know that you can't see it. But as you can see, this grid has a middle line that is like both vertical and horizontal that can be used for composition. And in a situation like this, what you really don't want to do is do this. Uh, never place the horizon line in the middle of the painting because that can be uh, very, very boring to watch. And that horizon line kind of like decides what your painting is about. And here I want to place most of the mountain in the image. So I need to kind of see if I can make this work. I will do one more size increase later, but this smaller size is so that I can kind of block in things really quickly and I don't run it into the maximum size of the brush at any point. So the subject of this painting is the mountain, so that's why I am doing all I can to kind of give it that kind of a priority in this composition. I'm gonna do a drawing guide, but this is not to be used as a drawing assist. 
I am just doing it so that I can decide for myself where the horizon line is because uh, for the perspective of the cloud elements I'm going to need that information. I'm gonna put it quite low. Yeah. And then just set these to almost not visible. Also, I'm gonna turn off the saturation of these. If you click on... Oh. If you click on one of those vanishing points, you can set the color for it. And I want to choose non-colors for these so that they don't affect the way that I do color picking in this painting. So now I have a better idea of how those clouds are going to be wrapping around this uh, mountain. If you have any kind of like organic elements near the ground, like one quick way that I always use to kind of cheat perspective is that I use transform for these. Even though I'm not aligning these to any specific perspective line, except of course uh, where my horizon line is, because I have those kind of like uh, same brush size brush strokes, just by doing this, I'm already like giving an illusion of perspective for this. Completely losing control of the whole thing now as I'm explaining it. Oh, I just want to press that thing. Okay. Oh, it's the snapping that is on, that is causing all the problems. So this is like handy if you have, for example, puddles of water that are in the going into the distance or any kind of like uh, pretty textures on the ground that you want to imply perspective through those. Now, as I'm moving more into the details, having more resolution will allow those details to be visible. This uh, Mikoral brush is pretty forgiving for scaling upwards. Obviously, if you have the hardware for it, you never need to be uh, scaling upwards. But when you are, I think it's good to be mindful of that the brush that you are using uh, scales up nicely. and I, 
that can vary a lot depending on what brush you are using. So I just recommend experimenting with it and making sure that the grain in the texture of your brush is high resolution enough. Because if it's already blurry and then you scale it up, that's just going to make the problem worse. I think my camera is like drifting. Oh my god. <laughs> I have this gross thing on the table that I'm trying to get out. Whoa, Christ. So <laughs> I have this under, under my uh, drawing tablet all the time because it's keeping it still. So when I have footage, it doesn't require me to do like digital replacement all the time because this is keeping my tablet like perfectly still. But I think during this live stream, I have accidentally kicked my C-stand, <laughs> which is not great. So. This is a problem, <laughs> but this is still fixable. It's much easier than having a tablet that is like drifting all over the screen for six hours and then trying to like digitally realign it to the screen. <laughs> it, it's one of those things that people who don't make YouTube videos, they just would not imagine how much time something like that can take. Like it's crazy. Uh, can you tell me how the soundtrack in the background is called? Uh, this music is all from uh, three different uh, sound services that I am subscribed to. So the kind of music that I search for to make this playlist is um, electronic ambient music, mostly. And then I just uh, search for the kind of mood that would fit this piece because I kind of knew what kind of a secret I wanted this piece to have. For me, it's almost impossible to paint without listening music. It's just an unnecessary ingredient. In the question and answer video, like one of the questions is what kind of music I like to listen to. So I kind of gave a non-answer to that because I'm just going to write a bunch of music that I like on screen and that way I can get rid of that question as quickly as possible because I'm sure that most people who are subscribed to this channel like they really don't care about that stuff at all but I care about it so much <laughs> that I can't give it a short answer so uh, I crammed all of the information into few frames of video Because when I start thinking about like what kind of music I really like, it that could be a whole week of um, me thinking about, about my favorite type of music and then thinking about what can I say in a video and what should I not exclude and so on. It's just never ending.
I know that one of the services that I use uh, also has some of their music uh, on YouTube, on their channel, but um, o o only few of the tracks. So you could try to Shazam it. And that might give you the results. There's also one artist on um, specifically epidemic sound uh, called Brendan Moeller who does electronic music and I have never heard a track from him that I didn't like and he has so much music and he has been making music for decades and it's just crazy that somebody is that talented and nobody knows who he is. I've been thinking that it would be fun to just sometime do a live stream that just has Brendan Moeller music. I love all of it, but it doesn't suit a lot of my art, I guess, so um, it would have to be something like fitting. Is anybody painting while watching this? Or doing something else? Yes, I'm actually painting with your dream treehouse line art. That's fun. I'm looking forward to seeing it. It's nice that somebody's doing it. I'm finishing off a design assignment for university. I miss schoolwork. I guess that's why I'm doing my own art assignment here. I just... There's something about that whole process that I think is interesting. I think all our art assignments are like uh, challenges, if you view it that way, and they are opportunities to grow in a creative way.
twin tile sets for game location. That's so painful to merge them. Oh, <laughs> I feel your pain. Uh, luckily, I have never had to do tile sets myself, but. I know what it's like. It, it's not a joke that I ever wanted to kind of like hog for myself. Especially because with all of that like technical stuff in games, you never can kind of like just have as it you have to do like all the technical stuff accurately or the game will break. Same for like any templates that need to be done for like asset stores. <sighs> Pretty much every time that I had to do like store banners or App Store or Sony's PlayStation Network Store, it was just <laughs> painful. Painful having to check all those specifications again and again and then you have like three different templates for composition and you have to come up with an image that is visually striking enough to be seen but at the same time it has to go with all of the guidelines otherwise parts of your image will be covered by some weird UI elements like I, hmm. Probably a fun challenge to somebody else, but I just wasn't built for that stuff. I mean, my patience can't handle it. Have you ever considered making a game? I'm done with video games for now. Except I have done like freelance work after I quit making games for games. Uh, but not full time anymore. No, I'm not considering full time game stuff anymore. Somebody's asking about screen protectors. I don't use screen protectors and I don't recommend having one. So that's all of the advice that I can give for that. I have never scratched a screen and I have done hundreds and hundreds of paintings on iPad. So it's you scraping this screen with keys that can scrape the screen, but not the pencil.
I don't like the friction that those uh, screen pro protectors give. I think it just makes doing paintings like these like so much harder and it just makes painting less fun when you can't do like smooth brush strokes and you kind of have to kind of scrape the screen against that friction. It feels like doing an oil painting but you haven't primed the surface and you don't have enough paint in your brush so you kind of like just like drag it across a dry canvas which just just the thought of that makes me kind of feel grossed out by the whole experience. I also have this like association from school that like once you have that feeling of friction when you're doing an oil painting it means that like you're killing the color because you are pushing it into the canvas itself and it might look great in that second but once the paint dries the color will die and that usually only happens if you feel too much friction when you're painting Unfortunately, I had a Alexander is saying uh, I had a luck to get the defective tip on the Apple Pencil and scratch the screen after one week of usage. How does that happen? Isn't because it's the same plastic in all of those. I don't know how a tip could even be defective because that would mean that they have used a different material. Was it the official Apple Pencil or something else? It is plastic against glass, so it does sound strange.
Which model of iPad are you using? Uh, this is the M1 chip. Brad Perry saying, this is my first time catching one of these streams while it's live. Yes. <laughs> hey, Brad.
how you visualize your artwork the stuck art <laughs> is uh, asking uh, that's um, username that is causing me to worry about your approach to art why are you stuck why do you feel like you're stuck and does it help to announce that you're stuck and make it as a part of your username? How I visualize my artwork? Mm. I think part of it, a big part of it happens in the process. When you have kind of like the main ideas from your idea, like the main concepts down on canvas already, and at that point, you can kind of look at the painting and let it tell you what it needs. And then I just apply all of my composition and color, color uh, rules to what I have at that point. And that is basically just like fixing the image over and over again. One area at a time. So it's like a checklist in my mind that I go through, like all of the composition rules and it's like one of those checklists that if you're in a spinning class or when you're running that uh, the instructors always uh, tell you these like certain things that like make sure that your core is tight and that you're not tensing your shoulders. It's the same kind of checklist, but for art. But uh, the difference with art and exercise is that with art, the checklist, it's, it's just much, much longer. So it takes a while to get through if I explain it, but uh, once you know it, it's kind of easy to go through in your mind. You just kind of check that all of your fundamentals are in place, and then you can get into the final details in that checklist. Once you pinpoint the areas that need to be fixed, then you fix them, and then you have a painting, and then you make the next one. Thank you. 
Oh, Alana is asking, um, have you ever struggled with making loose brush strokes? Yes, of course I have. Uh, my teachers keep telling me to loosen up a bit, but I'm too much of a perfectionist. So you know that perfectionism is fear, right? You are afraid that um, people will judge your current skill level with what they see in your work. And you have this perception in your mind of your own skill level, and it's not quite matching what you feel like your current skill level is when you are painting. And you are kind of afraid that other people will judge or that mismatch of ideas, and it will feel very painful when those uh, two separate um, skill levels kind of balance out when your perceived skill level and your actual work finally kind of meet and then you are able to see your own work the way that it is currently and then you start progressing but you kind of need to go through this kind of painful phase first i'm sorry there's like no easy way to do it but it is uh, a phase that you can get over But uh, it's going to suck. So, sorry for delivering the bad news on this. But once you get over it, uh, there's only like greatness on the other side. So it's the hardest part of becoming an artist. But it's also the most necessary one. And it doesn't last forever. So like I said, I think in my previous live stream already about this same stuff is just set yourself some time limits. Time limits are a good way or pick a tool that doesn't allow you to be a perfectionist. Um, for me, I use a lot of um, post-it notes for sketching with uh, marker pencils and nobody does like anything super beautiful with those tools in that size, uh, especially with these hands. So it's a good way for me to sketch some ideas and not worry about at all what uh, a drawing is going to look like because it's a sketch, it's not finished artwork. It's okay if it's silly as long as there's a good idea there that I can use for a painting. Another method that I use is um, the blackboard that I have in my living room. I use uh, white chalk on it and because it's a painted blackboard it's kind of like a very bumpy texture so there is <laughs> nobody who can draw a perfect line on that blackboard which makes it perfect for sketching quick ideas because they're always going to be like wobbly lines anyway so and i can't pull out part of the wall and preserve it as an artwork so it's for ideas only because it can't even be preserved so that's why it's great for sketching and getting rid of uh, perfectionism uh, another kind of like more difficult way to do it is to pick a brush that has a lot of uh, character in it that is going to act up when you use it and it's going to produce uh, sudden unexpected textures and then just commit to that one brush and say to yourself that I'm going to finish this whole painting with this one brush and those marks that suddenly appear appear as you're using it are going to be there. So you probably have a brush already in mind that you have seen in your uh, application library that could fit this description. One brush that I'm thinking myself, but like it in no way does has has to be this. It's not even available anymore. But uh, I made this brush for my members that was available for a limited time that was called Pastel on Wood and 
it's probably the brush that has the most character <laughs> out of all of the things that I have created. Now, any brush could like perform this same function, but I remember that it felt like I really had to allow the painting to live because I was doing it with a brush that has a lot of character in it. There is, for example, in Procreate, there is a, a brush similar to this brush called um, Nikko Rao. It doesn't really have a lot of texture, but like something like that, but maybe like put the texture up in a bigger scale and add more um, contrast to it. That could work. Or anyway, like if you understand the concept, then you will have no problem finding a brush that would fit that purpose for you. Uh, no, Noelani Magnus has this uh, brown bear in the icon, so I don't know if you have been around during the time when I released Pastel on Wood. That was <laughs> a roller coaster. I wanna use it for uh, another painting, and I have an idea of like what that painting should be. I don't really wanna talk about it too much because I always feel like if I talk about my plans then I'm way less likely to make them, but um, yes, I have an idea that I would like to use that brush for very fitting. One thing that also helps with perfectionism is when you start posting your artwork online. Like even if it's like timed sketches, when you have, for example, agreed to do five paintings in one hour and then you post all of them to your Instagram account, you will notice to your great delight or horror, hopefully the former, that no one cares at all. <laughs> And I think this is like one of the most freeing things that you can learn about art is that nobody is that concerned with your skill level of painting and your art at all as you are. So you are free to make all of the mistakes in the world and this will be an invaluable, irreplaceable skill because it will free you to experiment and learn new things much faster than trying to produce something that everybody would like. Because not everybody is going to like your art, no matter how good you get. Because the things that you want to talk about in your art, not everybody is going to agree with you. And that's great. It's much better to make amazing, memorable art for a few people than technically perfect, inoffensive art 
that nobody really gives a crap about, really. But if it's just like liked by most people, it's not going to be anyone's favorite art ever. And this way you can like even find good things about those moments when you like have your first online haters, then you can be sure that you have found something that is like hitting a nerve that is important to you, but at the same time is also dividing opinions a little bit, at least. I think the great thing about us, all of us, and I'm not just talking about myself, but like all of us have these uh, assumptions that things are going to be easy when we start doing them. If it's art or like any other skill, like we have this uh, foolish confidence that is based on nothing except our like assumptions about our own skill levels, which are completely misguided. But this is a really good thing, because it's the only way that I have been able to start learning new styles. That's why I do so many different art styles, because in the beginning of every one of those, I went through the same phases. At first, I would be declaring to the world that I really hate this one specific art style, and I think that those artists are complete hacks because they are making something this easy. Then I made it myself and completely fell face first on the concrete understanding like, oh, wow, this, <laughs> this is a really difficult skill that I have no idea how to do any of this. And then I could be begin my learning process of like learning that style. But if I didn't have that kind of like foolish confidence, like I'm going to be great at this from the get go, I would have never started. But it's that thing that will drive you to do new things. So I don't think it should be something that you are endlessly embarrassed about because it's also a great asset to learning art and finding new things about it. Basically, we're all human that way, so I don't think that's anything to be embarrassed of. This is probably going to be like the worst click-through rate thumbnail that I have ever done on this channel, because how am I ever going to fit this in that video thumbnail? Ugh. Well, I guess a Q&A video is something that only subscribers of this channel are interested in anyway, so I'm gonna keep my expectations very low.
Okay, I am almost at two hours. I think I have like stuff <laughs> done, so it's not a completely wasted live stream so far. I think there should be like small rocks on these grassy plains. Like erosion from the mountain.
a good thing about this palette is that it's not that far away from the palette that I have been using up to this point. It's just giving me a bit more nuance in those hue differences without having to spend that much time on those difficult color choices. Usually most people are uh, sleeping, sticky art, it's because of the time. Uh, I think I have an opportunity to do a night live stream soon, because my boyfriend is working a night shift at the hospital. But I also need to finish this video that I am making, because uh, I, I really need to. Finish more videos more quickly. It's pretty much the thing that I have focused on the most this entire year. Like how to produce more videos without losing the quality in the process. And most of it has been just fine-tuning small things that end up taking me a lot of time. One of those is uh, this light system, and now I have fine-tuned the light system so that I can press one button with my foot here under the table, and it will just like light up all of the lights in the room that I'm using, except that ceiling lamp, which I never should have on, but I have forgotten to be on. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> it means that it's more difficult to color correct the footage later. because it's not a video light. Whenever I talk about this, sometimes people say that like you should just hire an editor, but like they aren't cheap. Video editing is a very difficult skill, and once you get to a level where you're good enough at it that you can sell that as a service, you could make more money by doing that for yourself than selling that service. So the price tags for good editors are pretty high. I know that anybody could go on Fiverr and sell editing work for 20 euros, but those aren't the ones that are worth the effort because you probably end up wasting more time fixing the mistakes on your own than just doing it from scratch yourself.
these noises are very triggering for Vivi. I don't know if I have told you this before, but uh, I've started to take um, Vivi to daycare uh, once a week. She's there just for a few hours because uh, she's never been alone for a full day. So we're trying to get her be used to spending more time alone and with other dogs. And there are people looking after her there. So I'm taking her to this place where she can spend some time wrestling with other dogs, which I think is good for her. <laughs> But uh, it's kind of far away, and I'm taking the bus from that uh, dog daycare place when I'm getting her home. And last time when we were in a bus, and it was almost a full bus, so there were tons of people there, and one of the fire trucks went by with all of those uh, alarms on. And it's one of those noises that she can't help herself from howling. Like it's the fire truck is calling her name and she needs to answer. So I was holding her in my lap and she was like doing this small howling song that she does. <laughs> and I could tell that she was trying to not do it, but she didn't help herself. Sander is saying, did you ever try any other app on the iPad like Procreate but Art Studio Pro? Mm. I don't have anything against Art Studio Pro, it's just another program. I like the brush engine of Procreate the most because I think it's the most flexible one. I would uh, like to try Fresco a few times to see if uh, Adobe has updated since it was released. I know that some people were really upset that it was so expensive, which it is considering the competition, but like I need to pay for Adobe program subscription anyway to run this channel, so since I have access to it, I'm like, why not give it a chance? I like trying new programs when there is um, some creative opportunities that I could uh, accomplish by using those programs. But if it's just the same, does the same job as, for example, Procreate does, then there's like not that much incentive. I know that it could be easy to go into these like endless art tool reviews, but I think spending time with all of that stuff is just taking away time from actual art making and art making is hard enough that I don't recommend that whatever program you end up choosing that you spend too much time in that choosing process because it really doesn't matter that much. If you like using Art Studio Pro more, then use it, but painting is not going to be different on it. Like all the same art rules apply. No matter what tools you have, even if they are not digital.
there are, for example, a lot of graphic graphics tablets manufacturers that email me and want me to do reviews of their products, but I don't want to review products that I wouldn't use myself. So, for example, there are three companies that have approached me to do um, graphics tablets reviews on graphics tablets that don't have a display in them. And I wouldn't use, nor would I ever recommend anybody to use a graphics tablet that doesn't have a display at this point, because it's a really hard skill to learn to use it, and I don't think it's really relevant at this day and age. Like, I have Intuos 3 here, just because it's a smaller tablet than the Cintiq one, so if I really need to use a tablet, I will use it. But uh, today there are tablets that are just as cheap as that Intuos 3 was but with actual displays, and I would choose that any day over a non-display tablet. No, I have never worked for Supercell in any way. I know one of the coders though from uh, my game development days because we were working in the same company. He's saying, I got a graphics tablet without a screen and honestly it was a waste of money. I could never get the hang of not looking at where my hand was in relation to the artwork. Yeah, it's, it's a skill. And for me, it took years to get used to it, honestly, to draw in a normal way without looking at my own hand at the same time. And... It, it's not a skill that I'm like in any way like super proud of because I don't think people these days need to learn that skill at all because the tablets that have okay screens like they are cheaper than the tablet that I have that doesn't have a screen. I, I think it's a useless skill and art is hard enough so I don't want to spend too much time on these like endless product reviews and what kind of screen protector you need to use and do you need to buy some kind of like weird rubber condoms for your Apple Pencil, like all of that crap is just like I'm not interested in that. I would rather spend that time and energy and maybe also money on art education of like how to paint because you can't buy anything that will make your art skills better. Except maybe like coaching, <laughs> coaching from somebody that you respect. And even then you have to be ready for it. Like I'm very grateful for the art school that I went to, but I also know that I was 
in that age where I was old enough to understand that I need to kind of respect my teachers to allow them to grow. Allow me to grow, like from what they tell me. And I respected them a lot, and I still do. I sometimes see them in art galleries in Helsinki. Sticky Art is saying, in my opinion, graphic, graphic tablets are kind of dead. I don't agree with that, because there are still plenty of programs that you cannot use on any iPad or even a laptop. And for example, when doing 3D sculpting, I do think that a graphics tablet is a huge benefit to doing sculpting. or texture painting. I was just doing texture painting today on this um, application that Adobe bought from that hippie company. I forget what the name was, but Substance Painter, that was the program's name. So I used that for the first time today and it seemed interesting. I think it would be fun to do like some kind of like a simple uh, 3D sculpt and then paint it in Substance Painter. Because then there is like uh, this new opportunity that the program allows me to do. It's not just another way to do the same thing. But it's probably just a matter of time before uh, Blender adds uh, extra painting that is uh, just as good as Substance Painter is. And it, it would probably be more beneficial to have a workflow where you can also sculpt if you want to make tweaks during the painting process without having to go through the hassle of exporting everything all the time.
what Saps <laughs> said. Yeah, that is true. Also, it was funny how that playlist thing happened on the members area, because I was actually in talk with actual Google YouTube people, and I was just because I knew that getting the playlist would be so beneficial to have in the future because eventually I'm going to have more and more of these from beginner to advanced videos because I make more of them whenever I possibly can. Obviously I'm always so busy that it's not always possible but when I have the opportunity I make those videos. So it's kind of like a growing problem that there is going to be information that is going to be stacking on top of other information and I don't want somebody who is kind of new to art go into the beginner to advanced videos and then just be kind of slapped in the face with like some of the more advanced concepts right away. So now that we have figured out this way to have those playlists uh, I finally have the tools to kind of organize the information in a way that when I have more of those videos, people will be able to see them in order that makes sense. Like for example, that shadow and light video, people won't accidentally see it before watching the white tutorial, because the information in the white tutorial is pretty much necessary to move on to the shadow and light part. And it was funny that because I thought that this is a simple question of like how can I make uh, a membership playlist but there is no such option in YouTube Creator Studio so I was kind of like throwing out these kind of ideas how I have shared, for example, videos in the past with uh, companies that have sponsored some of my videos. Those were shared with the companies in private before I published those videos because they need to be approved by those companies. And they were all kind of asking each other that, like, does this actually work? We are gonna create a dummy account to see if this assumption is true and then they confirmed to me that like we tried it with a dummy account and it works. I just thought it was so strange that like a company as big as YouTube that there would be a question that is kind of like so in my mind simple that it, it would stump their customer service team and they needed to test it during the day before they got back to me that it works. Also, it's so amazing that I can just open a 24 hour customer service line with people of YouTube and get help like this. Otherwise, I would have never been able to do it. But considering how big of a company they are, it's just like amazing customer service. I'm so happy that like sometimes these situations happen where I can say that customer service is great <laughs> because there are so many situations where customer service is not great. Like for example, any TV streaming service that I'm using, like the customer service is just total crap. In my personal experience. Also, there have been like few times where people have had like technical issues with Camroad, I always try to remind people that Camroad is not a store that I run. It's a vendor that is selling my products. So they have their own customer service and that customer service is really great because usually people contact me about those problems. 
uh, which is the slowest way to go about it. Like I always recommend that contact Camroad first because they always reply. At least to me, they have replied within the same day, and they are always able to solve those problems. And I also say this because of like security reasons, because like people should never be sharing like any of their payment information with me, because it's uh, Camroad that does all of those processing stuff. But I've never had a problem with Camroad that I wasn't able to solve within the same day because of their customer service. So, and they are not paying me anything <laughs> to say this, but it's one of those instances where I'm really happy with the customer service. Here in Finland, we don't have a tip system in restaurants, so the customer service here is usually pretty... Uh, it's not bad, but it's at least it's very bland and uncaring. I wouldn't want a tip system, just to be clear, because I think it's unfair for the waiters. They already get paid so little, and then to have the whole salary depending on something so unreliable, I don't think it's fair. Um, William is asking, what got you into art? Your channel inspires me to learn, but I don't draw well. I just want to paint just like you. I love your style. Well, first of all, I recommend painting just like you paint, but that will probably come later. But what got me into art? I guess I was like always drawing and painting, but for me, even as a child, I think video games was definitely a big factor. Back before I had any other reasons to paint. Hey, I got Jones. 
a member for four months. I have tried both for some time. Oh, uh, William continues. I have tried both and for some reason painting just feels better to me. I think people are kind of divided into these two groups. Some people see things through uh, three-dimensional volumes and some people see them through outlines in a more natural way. Of course, some people draw in a way that is more closer to painting, but uh, the division between outlines and uh, volumes, I think that exists between people. I could think about, for example, like uh, a small group of people that were in the same art class with me in art school, and I could easily pick each student and say that like in which of those two groups they are, even though they had different styles. But that doesn't mean that I dislike drawing. Um, I think that's sometimes the assumption that people make. I I like choosing the method of like how an illustration is made based on what the message is and what method would be the best way to get that point across. So it's not really even about me, it's about piece itself and how to deliver that message in the most impactful way possible. I think it can be dangerous if you are so married to your own style and branding that you let that come in between what your creativity wants to say and how you are saying it. If people only see your brand, then you're not letting your paintings speak for themselves. That whole uh, scenario, I think, was further enhanced by Instagram when it came as a platform for artists to show their work and these online portfolios that it became popular to even control the way that all of your work looks in a grid or in a gallery mode. And I would just feel that it's way too restricting when I start to paint to Think about how how is this going to look like in my grid view? <laughs> what kind of colors do I need to use? Or do I need to put some kind of filter on everything so that it looks cohesive? Yeah, <laughs> I think that would be just demotivating for me to paint anything. There is this one video idea that I haven't quite formulated in my mind, but it, it has something to do with art being this all or nothing type of a project when creativity comes and gives you an idea. You can just kind of go along with a creative idea. It is asking you to kind of forget yourself and forget your the way that you want to present yourself to the world. If you want to paint in the honest, most honest way possible, you at some point have to like really go all in and forget that other people are going to see your painting. And it's not about them and it's not even about you, but it's about the idea and you are kind of at some point letting the idea take you and be more important than you are. And there's no kind of like half-assing it. There's no kind of making art like that. It sometimes 
creativity can be waiting for you to show up in a way that like, okay, I'm willing to drop everything for this idea to be done in a way that it needs to be done. Like for example, for me, this often happens in the form of uh, deadlines when I feel like I really need to publish a new video because my views and subscriptions are going down and I'm going super broke. But then a painting can just be like, no, we still have all of these details to put in and it's not going to be done until they are in there. So you need to kind of like forget about all of your work stress stuff and just sit here and work with this. When I painted, for example, the winter coffee shop, that was one of those moments, definitely. When I painted the flying airship, that's when I kind of had to let go of my entire schedule. And just many, many projects. When I did the train underpass bridge <laughs> illustration with uh, Vivi in it, that was one of those moments again where I was under extreme time pressure because if I remember correctly that was a sponsored video and there was a deadline for it and I was past that deadline but the painting wasn't done and I just couldn't release that video because it would have been like disrespectful towards the painting idea that at that point I had grown to love enough already that I cared about it. I'm very happy that with the way that that painting or illustration came together. I'm just doing like brushstroke grouping in this whole area and I think brushstroke grouping here is already pretty self-evident. Here it's still a mess and here it works. So this is probably what I should be working on but I honestly don't know how to do it yet. Maybe it's not a good idea to try to make it in this live stream. It needs a bit more time. And then clouds, but that I will probably do later because it's going to involve a lot of layers and... For that reason it makes sense to do it last. But that is going to wash away a lot of like this area contrast here so that it looks further away. So that's why I'm not too worried about that level of contrast there yet. What's that room? It's a cup of There's a small dog visiting me. Luckily, I have always treats in my pockets. Uh, hmm. Is there a difference between... William is asking, is it possible to be a great painter but bad drawer? And I think those kind of skills are pretty much tied because you can draw in the same way that you paint, just without colors. But this is going into very advanced uh, discussion about drawing techniques. So maybe it would be make more sense to talk about line art versus painting, but. I don't think it's necessary because you can you can draw the way that you paint. Fiery Blades is asking, is there a difference between doing art on computer and iPad? 
and also is it hard to learn? Like art is hard to learn. Programs are super easy to learn. You just pick a brush, you prick the brush size and then the opacity. I almost always have my opacity at 100%, so even that's not a problem, and then you start painting. Now you have learned all the technical stuff of how to use, for example, Procreate. So Procreate is very easy to learn. So is Photoshop if you learn those controls. But the problem with Photoshop if you use it on a PC is that you see all of these other buttons as well. And I have done enough concept art classes where the main tool that people use is Photoshop. And I have to constantly like slap students' hands to get away from all of the fancy filters and smudge tools because those are not going to help them to learn art. So art is really difficult to learn, but it has nothing to do with learning Photoshop or Procreate. Those are two completely different things. One takes one day or 15 minutes. Like honestly, you can learn all of these skills from what I just said, but art takes a lifetime. And people like usually think that those two are the same thing and that can be very frustrating. What are your thoughts on NFTs? I have complicated thoughts. I think people think about it in a very binary way and it's the public opinion that matters. Right now I think it's a PR suicide to release an NFT. I take issue with the carbon footprint of producing an NFT on these most popular sites. So when, for example, artists that I follow release NFTs on, for example, on Foundation, like, it's rough because I kind of lose respect a little bit for them because of that. There are ways to produce uh, NFTs and to do minting that is like 99% more environmentally friendly, but those techniques are not used in the most popular sites. And I think most people understand at least this much about NFTs. And this causes the entire industry to have kind of like bad reputation, but it's up to the people to kind of change that perception. But I would love NFTs to grow up from this phase because all of the technology to do it in a more responsible way like they are already there like we're not waiting for some innovations for uh, nfts to be more environmentally responsible but it's just up to these big companies to make the change and so far they haven't done it so it seems frustrating Uh, Kelk Sticks, I'm sorry if I said that name wrong. How do you keep going when your drawing is still in the ugly stage before you start to see take form? I, can, I can't get past this barrier. You are missing the entire part in the painting process when you are learning painting. So when you go into that phase where the painting is just ugly, that means that you can't yet pinpoint those areas that need fixing. Like that is the checklist. And sometimes that takes a really long time to find what those uh, pain points are. But if you run away from that challenge, you will never learn those things. So 
I think this is especially true in digital painting that you can keep working on a piece endlessly. If it doesn't work, you can just keep working on it until it's done. And if you take that attitude, like learning art can be so much faster than making all of these different ideas and then stopping the process when it starts to feel hard. Because art is always going to be hard. Like for me, it's hard every time. Like this painting is hard to do. But every time you run into those moments, it's a sign of like you being close to something that will grow, make you grow as an artist. So I think it's a cool thing when you find those moments. If art just feels easy from start to finish, it just wouldn't be that interesting because you are not having any kind of journey in the process. And I think that's what I'm here for, at least. I'm here for the journey. How long have you been live already? Anith Yin is asking. 2 hours and 38 minutes. So I need to stop soon because I haven't eaten anything today and it's three and a half hours past my normal lunch time. And I eat lunch at the same time every day like clockwork. Otherwise I will get really hangry. <laughs> Also, this small tube of fur needs to be taken out for a walk. Jade is saying, yeah, I also feel stuck at the messy stages of my art. I have to keep reminding myself to trust the process. I feel reassured using the iPad because there's layers and undo options. Yes, <laughs> one of like my big uh, undo tricks is to create this sort of like safety net layers. So if I'm like deciding to do something that is like super risky, like for example, let's say that I got the crazy idea of like, maybe I want to punch a hole into this mountain, then I can just make a new layer and start working on that idea uh, separately, so that I know that I'm not like erasing that work of like painting this layer. And this is a way that you can uh, try new ideas with like bigger safety nets than undos, because undos they will run out at some point on most applications. I should probably uh, start <laughs> paying more attention to her because I'm hearing like sounds now coming from the bathroom, which usually means that if I don't know what's happening, that usually means with a corgi that something bad is happening. <laughs> and I have gone through this process enough times that I know how it is. Okay, and just as a preview, I think having these glows, it might be cool if like some of them are kind of casting light 
on these clouds. And I think that would be kind of like an interesting, mysterious texture in the foreground. So that's what I will be working on before this painting is finished. Okay, but now it sounds like there's like some kind of an acute disaster <laughs> happening, so I really need to go. But uh, thank you all for joining this stream, and the finished painting will be in my next video, I hope, if the footage isn't destroyed. Okay, thanks for joining this, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye. It's always super awkward when I'm kind of scrambling to stop the stream. <laughs>